So, digital currencies. They've begun to hit the news again and are gaining loads of attention as BTC has been approaching its all-time highs. But this time actually looks very different to 2017. So if you are a holder, you're going to be feeling slightly euphoric at this point. If you're not a holder, you're probably a bit confused. You're probably thinking things to yourself like, but I thought that digital currency fad was over. I mean, what even determines the price of digital currencies like BTC in the first place? I mean, they're not backed up by anything, right? And why is Arya Stark buying it? So in this video, I'm gonna do my best to try to answer all of your questions. I'm gonna tell you what you need to know about digital currencies. I'm gonna explain why some people are investing into them, and then I'm gonna give you the tools to decide whether it's right for you or whether you should stay out of the market. Now, to be clear, I am not gonna sell you on anything, and I'm not gonna hype anything up at all. I'm even gonna conclude this video by saying that many of you should not invest in this market. Genuinely, in this video, I am just gonna share my research and my honest thoughts with you. All I will ask from you is that you simply watch this video with an open mind, because I'll be, I'll be completely honest with you straight away. For a long time, I kind of understood what blockchain was, but I didn't really get why BTC actually had value other than people speculating on the price going up. So if you're skeptical, firstly, I get it. I was for a long time and I say good. It is good to be skeptical in new things, especially when they're going up so much in value. But I'm going to try to explain it in a way which might make sense to you today, because this was the way which someone explained it to me and then the penny really dropped for me. Hey, welcome back to the channel, I'm Tom. I release videos every Tuesday and Friday talking about investing and personal finance, really digging into the data and the research. So if you're a bit of a nerd like me and you like those kind of things, be sure to subscribe. Now, before we go any further, you're gonna hear me say BTC a lot during this video instead of bit Well, we can thank YouTube for that. Apparently they like to shadow bound videos that say the word bit What absolute Bust. I also want you to know up front that I am invested in BTC and digital currencies. In fact, to people who have followed the channel for some time, you'll know that I've been working full time in the blockchain sector for nearly four years now. So I'm really not just jumping on the bandwagon as it goes up. I have literally spent years researching this stuff. And the reason that I wanna be upfront and tell you that straight away is because firstly, I wanna be honest with you. And second, I want you to know that I am biased. I mean, I'm gonna discuss the risks and the negatives with digital currencies too in this video as I try to be impartial and give you the information that you need. So I'm gonna approach it from both perspectives, but I want you to know straight away that I am biased. I mean, obviously as I am invested, that does mean I'm putting my money where my mouth is, but I want you to know that straight away. I don't wanna hide anything. Okay, so let's get into it. The first question that you might have is, why is Arya Stark buying BTC? Or maybe you're just wondering, why are digital currencies all over the news again? I mean, I thought they died after 2017, right? Well, the simple answer is, the price is going up. Let's be honest, when the price of something rises in a short time and people make money, that gets everyone's attention. This is what has happened to the price of BTC so far in 2020. When we break this down to numbers, at the time of recording, BTC is up 150% so far this year. For context, the S&P 500 is up 9% this year. Now, let me jump in for a second. Like I said before, I'm gonna explain the risks for digital currencies later on. I mean, you don't get returns over 15 times higher than the stock market without a lot more risk too. I don't want you to think I'm selling you on anything. I'm at this point just trying to present the facts and this is the price so far this year. Those are the facts. So those numbers have grabbed the attention of the everyday investor, people like you and me. But these numbers have caused much larger investors to take note too. So in the past two years, BTC is up 309% compared with 53% for gold and 35% for the S&P 500. In the past three years, BTC is up 122%, while gold and the S&P are up 45 and 37. For the last four years, BTC is up 2,365%, and in the past five years, it's up an astonishing 5,539%, 
while gold is up 74% in that time and the S&P is up 71%. Now, I know what you're thinking, and don't worry, I feel exactly the same way. I didn't buy any then either. As you know, I'm 25, and I still live with my family. So clearly, I am no digital currency millionaire. Also, you're probably thinking, who cares about the past? All that matters today is the future. And past performance, it's no indication of future results. On that point, I totally agree. But the point with this is just that when you see numbers as ridiculously good as this, it's usually worth taking a look at what's going on. It doesn't mean that the investment is good, absolutely not, it could be really bad, but it's just worth looking. Recently, Ray Dalio has been criticizing BTC, saying that it can't be a currency or a store of value. So I'm gonna explain why I think that's wrong. But to do that, I need to answer the question that nobody seems to be able to answer. What actually is BTC? So, BTC, it's a peer-to-peer -peer decentralized network running on blockchain technology. Confusing, right? Let me break it down for you. So, here is some cash. And if you were in the room with me right now, I could just hand it straight to you. With cash, we can pay each other directly. The money moves from me to you, and there's no need for anyone else to be involved. Like I say, I can just hand you this note, and now you have cash. But what happens if you're not in the same room with me? I mean, right now, if I wanted to pay you some money, what would I do? I could pay you on the internet. I could send you maybe a bank transfer, in which case my bank and your bank have to approve the money being sent. I could send you money on PayPal, in which case PayPal would have to approve it. Whatever method that we use to send money to each other, there is always a company in the middle who has to approve it. With this cash, I can just hand it to you directly. But online, there's always that middleman, always that company. So one day, a person or a group of people called Satoshi Nakamoto simply asked the question, why can't we just send each other money directly online? Why can't we have a digital version of this cash where we don't need a company in the middle? A few people had asked this question before, but Satoshi was the first to figure out how to actually do it. And that is how BTC was born. It was the world's first digital cash. I am not gonna get technical in this video and talk about miners or nodes or proof of work or anything like that. I might do that in a future video, but to keep things simple here, I just wanna explain to you the concept of what digital currencies are. Over time, as more and more people have started using the BTC network, something became kind of clear. It might be a little bit too slow for everyone to use it as cash. And that's why today BTC looks more like digital gold than it does digital cash. And I know, I know, that may sound crazy on the surface, but surprisingly, when you dig into it, there are actually more similarities than you'd think. Like I say, I was very skeptical of this too. So one of the reasons that gold is valuable is because there is a limited supply of it. So throughout history, countries have used it to transact with each other. And it was great because you didn't have to worry about the other country printing more of it like they do with their own currencies. That's why gold has been used as a currency for many years. Like gold, BTC is limited in its supply. Every four years, the inflation rate drops. And that means there will never be more than 21 million coins in existence. And no country or individual can ever change that. Like gold, BTC also isn't associated with any one country. It exists on the internet and anyone can contribute to the network or buy the currency. But I know exactly what you're thinking because I had the same thought. Just because something is limited in supply, that doesn't make it valuable. When you have gold, you have a physical item, something which you can use in certain industries or make into jewelry which you can sell to someone else. So clearly gold has an intrinsic value. So supply is only half of the equation here. The other half is demand. Why would someone actually want to buy it? Why would someone want to buy BTC? And I mean, sure, you might buy it to sell it at a higher price at a later date, but I mean, come on, that's not sustainable. For something to have value, there needs to be a better use for it than just the price goes up. And this is, like I said throughout, this is the point that I was quite skeptical on and I'm gonna hold my hands up and say it took me a while to actually figure out this point myself. So I understand if it's your biggest point of skepticism. I'm gonna share with you the explanation which made the penny drop for me and I think this is quite an interesting and unique way of actually thinking about it. So I hope that this helps for you too. 
The first thing to do is to stop trying to define what BTC actually is, and let's just ask the simple question, why will there be demand for it other than speculation? The answer is that there isn't just one answer, because there isn't just one use. So BTC has been described as a platypus before. You know, that really weird animal which doesn't quite fit neatly into one category. Well, BTC doesn't fit neatly into one category either. And that confuses a lot of people, myself included, for some time, but that's actually BTC's biggest strength. You see, instead of just having one use, what makes it valuable is there are several potential uses that could develop over the next few years. Now, I'm gonna tell it to you straight, and in my opinion, I don't think any of these potential uses are quite there yet. But each of these uses, they are getting closer and closer with each passing year. So let's get specific then. What actually are these uses? Well, as the first and strongest decentralized network in the world, it can be used to send large amounts of money across the world in a cheap and unblockable way. So you might have tried to send a hundred or a thousand dollars in BTC and notice something. It sucks. Yeah, no, really, it does. You know how before I said that it's too slow to be digital cash? Well, when you're sending small amounts, the kind of amounts that we might send, it is far too expensive and it's far too slow. However, when you start sending large amounts of money, that actually totally flips because a transaction might cost, let's say $10. And when we're sending $100, paying 10 as a fee is an absolute joke. But when you are sending $100 million and paying maybe even a few thousand just to make it quicker, a 0.001% fee is actually much cheaper and faster than traditional methods. So without getting too technical on the reasons why, BTC sucks at sending small amounts of money, but it's amazing at sending large amounts. And because large businesses and banks have to send tens or even hundreds of millions in one go, the system that they use today is much slower and much more expensive than using BTC. So if BTC can capture just a small amount of this market, that's the first and potentially huge use case. Secondly, it can be used to protect against confiscation. So in countries with, let's say, not the best governments, people need a way to protect their money. Money in a bank can be blocked. Physical items like property, gold or cash, they can be confiscated. But because BTC exists on the network, instead of in your house, it can be used to store money in a way which can't be confiscated. Again, if it captures just a small chunk of this market, that's another potentially big use case. Thirdly, BTC could be the digital version of gold. So for this one, I'm actually just gonna hand it over to the CIO of BlackRock. And to give you some context, BlackRock are the single largest money manager in the entire world. And this is their chief investment officer. So Andrew, I mean, I think, listen, I think cryptocurrency is here to stay. And I think it is a durable, and you've seen the central banks that have talked about digital currencies. I think digital currency and the receptivity, particularly millennials' receptivity of, uh, of technology and cryptocurrency is real. Digital payment systems is real. So I think Bitcoin is here to stay. I think, you know, do, am, I a, am I a Bitcoin bull? I mean, I don't do a lot of it or virtually any of it in my portfolios, my, my, uh, my corporate portfolios, my business portfolios. But do I think it is probably, I, you know, it's hard to say, is it worth the price it's trading at today? But do I think it's a durable mechanism that, that you know, do I think will take the place of gold to a large extent? Yeah, I do, because it's so much more functional than, uh, than passing a bar of gold around. Let's repeat that key quote there. But do I think it's a durable mechanism that, that you know, do I think will take the place of gold to a large extent? Yeah, I do, because it's so much more functional than, uh, than passing a bar of gold around. Now, remember that this is one of the very top people in the largest money management company in the entire world. I think it's an understatement to say that this is a pretty big deal. The fourth potential use is that BTC may be used as a currency in emerging markets when they begin to devalue their own currency to such an extent that it becomes almost worthless. And when we consider that the average traditional currency lasts only 27 years, this actually happens much more often than you might think too. So when did the penny drop for me? The penny dropped when I realized that there could be demand from any one of these potential use cases. 
Maybe BTC will be digital gold. Maybe it won't. Maybe it will be used in all four ways. Maybe it will fail in three and only be used in one of these ways. Maybe there will be even more ways that we haven't even thought of today. Just like the internet, we couldn't conceive everything that was going to happen. The big moment for me was when I realized that it doesn't really matter if you can pick holes in one of these arguments. For BTC to not be useful, you have to pick holes in every single possible argument. Because if even just one argument is correct, then that means it will have demand outside of speculation. If it has demand and a supply limited to 21 million, then it's gonna have a real fundamental value. Of course, what that fundamental value is, is another debate. But what's interesting is when you begin to run through the market sizes of each of these four use cases, you realize that most of them are actually in the trillions of dollars. Whereas BTC today is worth just a few hundred billion if you add all of the coins together. So I'm not gonna sit here and say that BTC will be digital gold or it's gonna be used to move money around the world. All I'm basically saying is that we know that this is the first and the strongest decentralized network in the world. And I believe that there is some use for that. I've offered four examples here, but like I say, it might be some of these, it might be all of these, it might be more. I just think there is a use case for it. I think there's actually a good chance that some of these are not going to come true, but I just think it's much more unlikely that all of them simultaneously will not come true, especially when you dig in to the fundamentals of what this actually is. Like the BlackRock CIO said, it is here to stay. And with it being legal and even regulated in many countries such as the United States and the United Kingdom, I really don't think it's going away anytime soon. So should you buy it? And what are some of the key points to look out for this time around versus 2017? Well, the first thing that you need to know is that BTC, it normally moves in cycles. Here, I'll show you what I mean. So if we look at this crazy chart, we can see that the price, it looks pretty steady to begin with, and then it explodes going on a parabolic upwards movement. A huge bubble forms, then the bubble pops, and the price spends the next 18 months crashing until it hits a low point. So I know what you're thinking. You already know this, right? You remember the big bubble of 2017. You remember everyone talking about BTC as the price soared, and then it crashed. Well, what if I told you that this wasn't 2017? In fact, if we go back to it and we look closely, we can see the date at the bottom was 2013 to 2015. If we scroll through the prices, we can see that BTC was around $150 before shooting to over 1,000, and then it crashed back down to around 250 in the next 18 months. For context, the price is around 18,000 at the time I'm recording this. Let's look at what happened in 2017. As we can see, it is basically the same chart. A build-up phase, followed by a bubble, then a pop, and then a long bear market. Now, let's zoom out. Remember that big bubble from 2014, the one we looked at first? It's shown here on the chart. At the time, the price had never been higher, so it seemed like a big bubble. But in the context of today's price, this bubble now actually looks quite small. So in Bitcoin's history, it's actually had four of these cycles. And the reason you've probably only heard about the 2017 cycle is just because this was the first one to really hit the headlines and go mainstream. So there are some investors, myself included, to tell you the truth, who think that we, we might now be in the next cycle. And there's this model called the stock to flow model, which has pretty accurately predicted the price in previous cycles before. For this cycle, it is predicting that the price will be around $90,000 or five times the current price by mid to late 2021. So the first thing to say with this is every model works until it suddenly doesn't. So for me personally, even though I think this model is really interesting and I know a lot of people love it, that's why I've included it in this video. To tell you the truth, I personally prefer just understanding the supply and the demand elements. So we know there are 21 million Bitcoin that could ever be minted and there are the demand elements that we already talked about. Again, if you prefer this model instead of those things, that's no problem. That's why I've decided to include both for you. We also have to consider that the 2017 bubble was fueled by everyday investors, people like you and me. This year, however, there are more and more institutional investors getting involved. So I'm talking about the big funds and the really large investors. 
I mean, for example, here we can see the search volume for BTC on Google. Even though the price is near all time highs, regular people simply aren't paying as much attention this time around. Instead, we have two public US companies investing along with some of the world's most famous investors. People like Paul Tudor Jones, Stanley Druckenmiller, the PayPal CEO, and many more top investors. And these guys, they do not generally buy and sell for a quick profit. When an institution buys, it's usually to hold for the long term. And I wanna make it clear that that's how I personally see this too. So I said there were risks at the start and I said I would cover them. Of course there are. The biggest risk in my eyes is the volatility. So on any given day, the price can genuinely crash 20, 30, or even 40%. Now, to be fair, it can also gain that much and even more on any given day, hence how it has gone up much more than it's gone down throughout its lifetime. But anyone who invests and panic sells or invests with less than a five year time horizon is just asking for trouble. So if you are going to look at it, this is a long, long term investment, not short term, because people that try to do a short term investment historically buy at the top and sell at the bottom with these cycles. Whereas the people, based on history at least, that have held throughout the cycles, do much better. And sure, if you buy at the bottom and sell at the top, you're gonna do the best. But realistically, nobody manages to do that. You also have to remember that BTC is very, very new. It doesn't have that kind of history that gold has. And that's why it's generally recommended to invest no more than 2% of a total portfolio into it. Now, to be fair, this also kind of comes down to your conviction levels. So for example, if this is the first time that you're beginning to hear about BTC and you don't really understand it, I would say you should not invest. You should only invest into something that you actually understand and believe in. So for me personally, I've been working in the industry for nearly four years now, so I have spent years building my conviction and doing more research. That means for me, I'm more comfortable investing more than this amount because I feel like I have a good grasp on the market at this point. I mean, to be fair, after four years, I certainly should. The key thing that I want to do with this video is just to explain to you in a rational, non-sales pitch type of way, why digital currencies are actually more grounded in reality than you might think. It's not just some crazy idea that you've heard on the news. But if the news and the hype do continue to build, you are going to be hearing more and more about BTC and digital currencies in the coming year. And unfortunately, most of what you hear is going to be from one of two camps. It's either going to be unresearched, baseless claims from people trying to pull it down, or it's going to be from people screaming at you, it's the best thing ever and you need to buy it now. I don't think either of those is really the right approach. I'm hoping if I can to be maybe a slightly more voice of reason and just tell you exactly how I think it is, whether that's good or bad. So every Tuesday and Friday, I release new videos for you. And if you've enjoyed this and you wanna keep up to date with digital currencies and investing and personal finance in a no hype, focused on the data kind of way, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next one. Thank you for watching.